Coming up on this episode of Faz TV, how data can improve your livestock enterprise, reducing potato damage during harvesting, and we're in Harris to find out about croft regeneration and diversification. In the heart of the Strathmore Valley in Perthshire, farmer Adrian Ivory is using key performance indicators and data to improve suckler herd efficiency. I'm Adrian Ivory, farm manager at Strathyla Farms based just outside Meagle. We're a mixed arable livestock farm. We also rent out land for peas and potatoes. We have 250 breeding cows which comprises of 150 commercial cows, 60 pedigree simmentals and 40 pedigree charolais. The commercial herd is made up of a base of a simmental crossed shorthorn cow. There's 150 of them. They run with the bull for nine weeks, all in the spring. We're, we're all spring calving. The reason behind that is we have a large acreage of harvest in the autumn and therefore we don't want to have the hassle of calving uh, cows and heifers at that time of year. We keep all the bulls, all the males entire and they're all killed through ABP in Perth. We've done this for many years, I have a good working relationship with ABP. We meet them every year to check that what we are producing is what their customers want to buy and what changes we need to make or what we need to do to make our product better for them. The top 25 heifers are retained for our own breeding purposes. The remainder are either sold to repeat private buyers on the farm or are taken to United Auctions in Stirling and sold in the storing. So we look at four key KPIs here. The first one we look at is days to calving. This gives a real insight into how efficient your cows are. We aim for as close to 365 days as possible. Last year we were 370, although there was a variation of 335 days to 440 days. The second KPI that we look at is weaning rate percentages. This looks at the weight of the cow and the weight of the calf at weaning. We are aiming for a 50% weaning rate, that's the weight of the cow, compared to the weight of the calf at 200 days. So we're aiming for 50% in the males and 45% in the females, although we'd like it to be 50% for everything. Last year the bulls were 49% and the heifers were 44%. So we're getting there, although there's still room for improvement. A key target here is our cow wants to be a medium sized cow and that is actually one of the key things we look at when we're looking at bulls to use. We don't want a bull with massive growth figures because they're just going to produce massive cows. So we're looking for a sort of mid medium sized cow. Our cows last year averaged 700 kilos, that is where we want to be. The third KPI, days to slaughter. We want these animals to be slaughtered as quickly as possible. It's good for the environment, it's good for profitability, it's, it's a win-win for everyone. So we're looking at getting as close to 400 days as possible, if not less. Last year we were 407 days, although there was a range of 365 up to about 440 days. And the final KPI which sort of brings it all together is the margin over feed. And this looks at the days to slaughter, days to calving, how much food the cows have eaten, how heavy the cows are, what body condition they are, and it brings it into an efficiency table. This allows us to retain the most efficient cow's offspring and get rid of the least efficient. So within this, the other thing that we look at is how the EBVs on the bulls that we've used have performed and whether there's any correlation there especially in the days to calving, where if there is a difficult calving, does that correlate to longer days to calving? We find the most important EBV in this aspect is actually gestation length. It has far more role to play than anything else. I think lots of people talk about, oh, what weaning rate did you get? For me, weaning rate is secondary. 
you have to have them in calf to get them to be weaned. So that what we will try and build on here is trying to get our, our uh, PD rate as high as possible. I would also add that we work on pretty realistic targets. I know some people think you should have 95% of your cows PD'd in calf and I'm sure lots of people manage that. Our size we don't and we target 90% and if we can wean in the high 80s in the last three years we've averaged 88% then I'm quite happy at that. Yes we'd like to be a bit higher but I've got to be realistic in my targets. The other aspect that we do every year which has been really important in helping improve things has been an annual meeting with SAC and Forfa, with Harbro who we get most of our minerals from and our vet and the two stockmen that I've got here. We're all involved in that meeting. It is very open, it's very honest. What's gone wrong? What's gone right? And let's see how we can move forward. Everyone, including the vets, SAC and Harbro, we all leave that meeting having learned something. So it's not only beneficial to me and my two stockmen, it's also beneficial to those who come in. The advice I would give to farmers, and this is not me trying to preach, it's, it's spend some time in the office. It's not the most enjoyable time in the world, but it's the most profitable time. We all love being out amongst our animals and going looking around, but a couple of days in the office where you can make sensible decisions and actually work out where you are and where you want to get to is more important than anything else. If you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And if you don't manage it, you can't measure it. So spend a little bit of time in the office, which you may hate doing, and just try and understand where you are, where you're trying to get to, and what the easy gains are. It's the old Dave Brailsford saying, 1% of lots of things adds up to a heck of a lot. Across Scotland, specialist growers produce potatoes for supermarket customers. The quality criteria for these crops is very demanding. Harvesting is a critical phase in the potato grower's calendar. Reducing damage and bruising at harvest, along with controlling disease throughout the growing season, is key to success. My name's Kieran Maloney, I'm a member of uh, SAC's Potatoes team. Um, I work at the Craveston campus, which is in, in Aberdeen, and um, we offer advice and support uh, to, to all members of the potato industry, so be that growers or, or packers or other companies involved in, in, in potato production. We're here at, at, at Main to Luther. This is Willie Officer's crop of uh, Maris Piper. It's going to a supermarket customer, so for the, for the ware market. The buyers will be really looking for skin finish. They'll be they'll be looking for uh, they'll have very high tolerances for for blemishing. They'll want to see not much blemishing, very kind of clean finish, and just something that looks attractive and something that, that consumers will be likely to pick up. Potato tubers, they're, they're living plant organs. When you harvest them, they're still alive. When you store them, they're still alive. That's why they grow back in the fridge. So anything you do to them, they'll have a physiological response. So you need to treat them very, very carefully, very delicately. So harvesting's a, a really skilled operation. You need a real professional to do it. So the key things that, 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 that are a problem at harvesting that could go wrong are, are damage and bruising. So uh, mechanical damage uh, on the surface, so that could be nicks or scuffs. Maybe if the skin set isn't complete, they're all points where diseases can gain entry. Um, and bruising as well, so if the drop, drop heights aren't calibrated properly, um, if there's any impact onto hard surfaces for the tubers, um, you can get brown spots in the flesh, um, black, black in areas bruising, and obviously that has, that's a big quality impact, and it's very commonly seen. Some varieties are more, are more prone than others. Um, Maris Piper is, is a susceptible variety, so the guys will need to be taking care uh, this morning. The only way to check quality for potato tubers is to dig them up. So um, growers will, will do pre-harvest test digs uh, to get a feel for their stocks, to see if there are any problems uh, that, that's showing up, um, get an idea of how, how, how close to skin, skin set we are, um, and so on. So in the sample that we've got here, the skins are well set. So that's, uh, that's positive in terms of harvest hopefully there will be minimal scuffing minimal damage and minimal losses and less waste 
Um, the quality for this sample looks good for, a, for a, a, a sample of tubers, for a stock of tubers destined for the supermarket. You'd wash samples up and, 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 and inspect them very closely. Um, the only problem with, which I can see visually here is there is some common scab on these tubers. So you can see these raised corky legions on a few of them. Depending on, on, on how severe that is and, and, and uh, the percentage of the, the surface affected, uh, that might get rejected uh, when it comes to the pack houses. So not all of these tubes will make it to the supermarket, unfortunately, but it's, it's, I've seen a lot worse samples this season. So um, yeah, not looking too bad. <laughs> In the field, the crop is harvested into one ton boxes and taken to specialist potato stores, which can keep the crop in good condition for many months. We now join Kieran as he inspects some crops at Ardoch. So uh, we're, we're back at the farmyard now uh, and we're look, we've taken a look at some stocks that have already been loaded into store. So this, uh, this is a different variety for a different market. We've got a royal crop uh, which is destined for seed. So the quality criteria are slightly different but there are still uh, uh, diseases and defects to look out for. So this sample's come out pretty well after we've washed it up. Um, we have noticed a little bit of damage on the surface of the skin which might be due to rhizoctonia and there's also been a small amount of scuffing. Uh, some varieties are more prone to that than others, some take a lot longer for the skins to set properly. And the reason that's an issue is because that gives a point for um, pathogens, fungal spores, bacteria to get into the tuber and start to eat away um, and, and at, 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 at the flesh and obviously that creates more wastage. So doing a check like this as, as the stock goes into store, so you can see the scuffing there, um, is really important because it, it informs how you manage those stocks going forward. So you might notice that it's a bit noisier in here, there's a bit of a background hum and that's because we're in a very modern uh, seed potato saw which has been designed specifically um, to, to, to dry and look, look after seed potatoes. So there's a positive ventilation system in here and um, you can see the gaps in the boxes. It's designed to pull air, to suck air through um, and the arrangement of boxes in the store is all of a mind to making sure the airflow is even and you're getting good drying throughout. So you'll notice that some boxes have bungs in, again that's to control where the air goes, how it's returned to make sure that we're, we're, we're drying this crop efficiently. The priorities for the grower are to dry, to cool and to cure. So um, anywhere there's free moisture on the surface of tubers creates a disease risk. So that's what you bring in from the field, uh, but also if there's any condensation in the store, if we create conditions where condensation is likely, uh, that, that's a real, a real worry as well because that's the kind of conditions that, that pathogens really like. Um, so you've got a ventilation regime here to, tr to try and dry the crop. Um, the next stage will then be to bring the temperature down. So uh, in here it's about 13 degrees. The target I think is around 4 degrees for this crop so there'll be a gradual pull down of temperature um, over the next 4 to 6 weeks. And the reason that we do that is so that you don't have big temperature differ differentials. Whenever you get cold, and warm mixing, that's a recipe for condensation, which we don't want to see. So hopefully over that time as well, those four to six weeks, all those little wounds that we saw, those little scuffs, that gives time for the plants to heal because the tubes are still alive, they're, they're living organs, they'll cure, and hopefully that'll, um, that'll create a barrier so that we'll see less problems as this stock is stored and goes to its intended market. Potato harvesting and storage is a complex subject. If you'd like to speak to Kieran or another member of the SAC Consulting Potatoes team, visit www.scottishpotatoes.org. Now we're off across the Minch to Harris, where the rugged landscape has been crofted for generations. To make a living on a 21st century croft requires considerable entrepreneurial spirit. Herbalist Amanda Sorin moved to the village of Northton in 2018. She was brought up in Scotland but was working in Sussex when she received a call from the Harris Distillery looking for some expert botanical advice. I didn't really know what was going to be available and what kind of plants there were, but I was very excited to come up. So they flew me up and they drove me around at breakneck speed, shouting, anything useful here? Is that any good? <laughs> and then I kind of wandered around and I found a few things that I thought looked quite interesting. Took them back down to Sussex where I was living, played around with them and um, made some lovely things. And then the distillery decided that they wanted to stock those. And so I started making them. 
Following Amanda's visit, and when the last of her five children had left home, she decided to move to Harris with her husband and continue her work with the Harris Distillery. The distillery made a very clear decision that they weren't going to make lots of different gins, which is what a lot of drink companies do. They make, you know, a rhubarb gin and a whatever. And they wanted to just do one gin and they wanted to surround it with interesting things. So that's where I came in. So I make um, a sugar kelp aromatic water that goes into the gin and I make limited edition tinctures from plants that I've picked um, here. I make a range of skincare for them that they sell in their shop. So it's actually a really interesting job that I have in association with them. And um, the sugar kelp aromatic water is a really beautiful addition. So it just gives a pop of the sea. So we have a chap who dives it for us, the sugar kelp, and then I, I distill it. Um, I have five stills, um, not, not on the size of the, the Harris distillery, but smaller ones. And I use those for all kinds of different botanical things. So that's, that's my work there, really. Since moving to Harris, Amanda has started using many of the wild plants that grow on the macher, as well as growing her own on the croft. The part at the back of the croft, at the sort of halfway up, is very, very wet. Really, really wet. Boggy, it's a heavy clay soil, it's very acidic. So it's not actually that, that useful, but bog myrtle grows really well on that. Um, and so I've planted quite a bit of bog myrtle and we harvest that. And that's a really beautiful botanical. On the lower part of the croft, we've got roses. So. It's obviously extremely windy here, especially in winter time. Uh, mad, squally, windy, very heavy rain, and um, it's a very heavy soil. But we found that Rosa rugosa grows really well here. And for my purposes, I needed a rose that has quite a lot of petals on it. And Rosa rugosa itself only has um, just a few, it's just a single. But there's another variant of that called Hansa, which has a double flower, so we grow that. So it's about how do you think about using plants that you know will grow here and find a variant of that that does the job that you need it to do. Then if you come down to the kind of the front bed, we've created some raised beds. So in those beds, we've been growing uh, lavender, which grows beautifully here, actually, which is astonishing. Um, chamomile, calendula, uh, hypericum, all sorts of things. Um, and those beds have done really well. Then we have a piece of land that we have up on the macca, and the macca is basically a shale sand. So it's very free draining, it's very light, and it's much more alkaline than the stuff we're dealing with on our croft. For my purposes, it's the wildflowers that I'm after. So I, I pick um, euphrasia, which is uh, eye bright commonly, um, clover, lots of red clover, white clover, um, meadow sweet, which grows magnificently all the way across here. It's beautiful. Um, we use a lot of meadow sweet and a lot of things that we do. So, well, I mean, seriously, all sorts. And then there's the sea. So, woohoo, there's all the seaweed. So, honestly, it's like a treasure trove. Some of the things we use for products that we make in the cafe. So, so for me, one of the really important things about being here is supporting the local circular economy and really paying attention to the environmental impact that we have here. So one of the things that I really like doing is picking and then using it in products. So we might make a strawberry jam and put meadowsweet in it, or we might make a chutney and put the seeds from the small hogweed, which tastes delicious, really spicy, lovely seeds. Um, we make a salt where we put the sugar kelp into it, we grind that up. So all sorts of things for the cafe and for the bakery. And then there's another whole raft of things which are to do with uh, drinks. So we've done drinks using dandelion, of course, dandelion root is brilliant. And then the most important thing I think is we've done a non-alcoholic drink that has just been launched about four weeks ago. And in that we have five botanicals that we've got here. The next stage of development on Amanda's Croft is the erection of a 20 metre by 8 metre Kida greenhouse. This will extend the growing season for many of her plants by three months. It will also enable Amanda to employ more local people. In this area in South Harris, it's really beautiful, but it's been designated an area of rural deprivation. And so although it is really beautiful, there's precious little work. So one of the things that I did was um, 
took on two apprentices. So we've taken on full-time year-round employees and two apprentices. And the apprentices are in distilling and baking. And we will have a horticultural one eventually, hopefully before too long. As Amanda continues to grow her business, her key piece of advice for other crofters is to always look for opportunities to diversify. There is a big move towards a greater awareness of provenance and this idea of the local circular economy and all the rest of it, and I think that's very valuable. But I think on an island like this, where traditional crofting still has a place, clearly it still has a place, if you want to croft, which will essentially give you year-round full-time employment, you're going to have to diversify from just keeping sheep or cattle or whatever. You need to start to think outside of the box. What can you do with your croft? How can you make use of all the different parts of it? And they're often very different, um, both in terms of soil and structure and all the rest of it. So how can you start to think about really making great use of your land so that you can actually have something that will support yourself and your family far more than just the traditional crofting methods? Stone's throw from Amanda Sorin's Temple Cafe in the village of Northton is a croft that has recently been brought back from a derelict condition into a working croft. Sue and Jerry Ward are the tenants of the croft and had no previous crofting experience. They enlisted the help of local SAC consultant Duncan McIntyre. I think it's um, vitally important for any area especially in these you know, more rural locations. Um, I think it, you can see the uplift it gives a, a community when you see you drive through a community, you see them working crofts, um, good for the local economy as well. It's Sue and Jerry, who, who are the tenants of this croft, um, had no previous experience of crofting and, and um, they had, SEC had been recommended to them um, as somewhere to give them ad advice on, on how to, to bring the croft back into, into a usable, usable state. The croft was used as a demonstration venue as part of the Farm Advisory Service's Derelict to Productive project. It was um, a, a mix of, a sort of uh, presentations by myself and Ian, who's a senior consultant, um, on the options that are available to, to crofters coming in and how to improve their croft. And then the second part of, of, of the day would be on a croft. So we had approximately 30 people down here on the croft split them into groups and, and did some, some sort of workshops with them looking at how you could improve the croft. Um, and from there, Sue and Jerry contacted us after the event and, and kick-started the whole process of, of getting some, some, some work done on the croft. When Sue and Jerry contacted us, the first thing usually we'll do is to look at doing a five-year plan for their, their croft business. And then from that, we'll advise them on the, the grant application process, what's available. And at that stage, will refer back to the five-year plan and for example access to the croft being the number one thing so that's the first project we looked at in terms of, of looking at grant funding for for sue and jerry for that on the rural payments guidelines there are approximately sort of 13 various options you can get under the croft and agricultural grant scheme predominantly things like croft improvements that type of thing the cags as, it, as it's called for that there's £25,000 worth of funding available over a two-year period so quite a substantial amount obviously the way things are at the moment you know if, if you're doing a major piece of work then it can take a fair piece of that chunk away so again it's useful to have that five-year plan um, so you can maybe stage out your finance as well um, look at what you can afford in the first year, second year and, and so on because um, that resets after two years so it goes back to the 25,000 after two years. We obviously deal with them on a daily basis, the Scottish Government Rural Payments Office here in, in, in Stornoway um, and they've been very supportive of us certainly. Um, we put a number of applications in in, in any given period uh, and they're always there, you know, they're willing to, to speak to us if there's any issues. They'll certainly lift the phone and speak to us, which is, is very useful. And they're, they're fully encouraging of, of certainly of, of existing crofters and new crofters um, accessing grant funding. For Sue and Jerry, for example, they've actually taken advantage of a bit of um, diversification and, and they've, they've erected a, a 
polycrub, a polycarbonate growing tunnel. So they're, they're growing fruit and veg. They work in, in conjunction with their, their neighbouring crofter, Amanda Soren, and supply uh, fresh fruit and veg to her as well for her local cafe. So that's part of, of what they do. Later on down the line, we're obviously looking at um, getting some stock on. Before that, the next project will be to secure the, the, the fencing and make sure it's stock proof. Um, and then we'll look at getting some stock on, grazing down what's already here because it hasn't been grazed in, in a good number of years. So that's their sort of next next plan. They're also looking at poultry and, and, and various other options as well. So they're, they're very busy people and very keen to do as, as much as they can. For more information, visit fars.scot. Crops around the country are really looking very well. They've established into good um, moist conditions. We're standing in a field of all-seed rape, which is fairly typical, so thick and well-established, and if anything, a bit too forward. And similarly with, with winter barleys, they are looking strong and well-established really throughout the country. Winter wheats, um, some have gone in early and again are looking good, but some of the later ones um, are still to be drilled uh, and you know conditions have turned a little bit wetter and stickier so some delays in getting them into the ground. So thinking about the advanced oil seed rapes at the moment we're coming up to the point where you'll be deciding about light leaf spot management. That's based on a risk assessment so we base it on the amount of disease in the previous crop and then how warm the summer was and the amount of rainfall in the winter. So we're in a kind of average to low risk situation now. We didn't have much disease last year, but on the other hand, we have had warm temperatures and we've certainly had rainfall. Because crops are quite advanced, there is an option to use fungicides like uh, tebuconazole, which has a, a growth regulating effect as well. Um, and pay careful attention to labels because some tebuconazole you can only use once. The idea of treating light leaf spot though is that you're trying to do it preventatively. So the spray you put on in the autumn is going to have to carry you through to the spring stem extension timing when we can think again about the risk and what you would do to manage it at that time. We've had a few reports of slugs and things as well, but actually not too bad in reap crops and a crop this established is now beyond the, the point of any risk. One of the things we're thinking about at this time of year in the winter cereals is the risk of aphids and the risk of barley yellow dwarf virus. Fortunately this year we've had very few reports of aphids and we're getting to that point in the year where temperatures are starting to drop. So we haven't had frost yet but we are at the point where aphid numbers are beginning to drop and the risk of virus transmission is reduced. So pyrethroid fungicides may not be needed for the winter barley crops this year. And perhaps thinking about the, the winter wheat crops then for the later drilled ones that are still going in at the moment the risk of slower emergence and damage from slugs or from wheat bulb fly are probably relevant. And again, thinking in terms of slug damage, once they get up to about the two leaf stage, they're beyond the point of, of damage. That's around growth stage 12. So, you know, you can reduce any inputs at that point. If you're drilling into to wet conditions um, and slugs are, are a risk, so for example, following all seed rape, then uh, pellets might be the recourse, obviously taking due care of any watercourses, drains and so on, and ideally using traps to judge numbers before you put pellets down, and also take due care of any watercourses or running drains, which again, there's more likelihood of drains running at this point in the year. Hello, I'm Raymond and welcome to the Rural Roundup. ARPIT have announced that the Agri-Environmental Climate Scheme, or EECS, has been extended until 2024, with a new application round each year. We will have a fully funded round in 2022, with a submission deadline of mid-April being anticipated. Check out ruralpayments.org for more information. As a result of a budget review, we will experience increased rates for Basic Payment Scheme and Greening in 2021. Combined figures are, for Region 1, £222.14 a hectare, or £89.89 .89 an acre. Region 2 is coming in at £45.09 a hectare, or £18.24 an acre. And finally, Region 3 payments at £13.68 a hectare, or £5.53 per acre. 
Finally, a reminder for all eligible producers in Region 3 to submit your Scottish Sheep Upland Support Scheme claim to ARPID by the 30th of November. Stay tuned for more from FAS TV and the Farm Advisory Service. Next time on FAS TV, we focus on alternative livestock. And we're back on Harris, where investment in a new shed is reaping benefits for one crofter. And we meet the former policeman who's now juggling life as a distiller and a breeder of Highland cattle. Mm -hmm.